Hello, I'm Dan Lynch, and coming up on Floss Weekly, I'm going to be joined by Aaron Newcomb as co-host, and we're going to talk to Chris McDonough and Mark Ram of the Pylons Project, which is a Python web framework. We're going to talk about all the stuff you need to know about uh, Python and web development and all that cool stuff up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly, episode 151, recorded February 2nd, 2011, The Pylons Project. It's time for another Floss Weekly, the show about free Libre open source software. And as you may be able to tell, Randall's not here this week, I'm afraid. He's off cruising. Uh, it's such a hard life. He's off cruising somewhere uh, on, a, on another uh, another cruise. So um, I'm Dan Lynch, and I'm, uh, I'll be your host for today. And I'm joined by uh, Aaron Newcomb from The Source Podcast. Aaron, how's it going? Good, good. How are you doing, Dan? I'm good. I'm good. It's 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 un, ungodly early at the moment uh, because we've we've come in early. We've moved the show an hour earlier because uh, Google have got the temerity to make a huge announcement um, <laughs> during during the Floss Weekly time. Uh, so we're we're here a little an hour earlier. So um, Aaron's very kindly made the trip uh, into the Twit Cottage uh, early in the morning, which is great. Yeah, yeah, no problem. It is early, but uh, got a little coffee here. I'm starting to wake up. I'll get there eventually. Mm. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So um, we got a really, uh, really interesting guest coming up today. And two guests, in fact, uh, two for the price of one, if you like. Um, we've got uh, Mark. Uh, Mark, hang on, let me get the name up. I'm getting that wrong. We've got Mark Ram from uh, from the Turbo Gears project, and uh, and also Chris McDonough from uh, the Pylons project. And they're actually we're going to talk about the fact that uh, they're both Python web frameworks. Uh, Pylons is a white Python web framework. A lot of people may know from uh, many years ago, it's been around a long time, Turbo Gears, essentially the same. And uh, they're actually merging a lot of stuff together now and trying to consolidate their efforts under the umbrella project of the uh, the Python, uh, sorry, the Pylons project, they call it. It's, it's all very confusing. So we'll, we'll try and uh, we'll try and clear some of that up. But essentially, it's, um, it's a, a way of building websites with a Python web framework um, and getting them up and running very quickly and, and you know, in a, in a very easy manner. So what do you think, Aaron? Well, I am kind of interested in this. I mean, I run my website, uh, thesourceshow.org, on Drupal. Um, I know a lot of people use Ruby on Rails, but I'm not as familiar with some of the Python uh, uh, frameworks. So, yeah, really anxious to talk to these guys and find out more about it. Cool. I'm a huge fan of Drupal myself, I should say. And um, I've actually done a little bit of development with a, a web framework called Django, which is another Python web framework. So um, I hope I don't geek out too much uh, on, on Python there and, uh, and scare off anyone else who's, who's maybe a Ruby on Rails fan or something. But uh, I'm sure there's lots of interesting stuff to talk about. So uh, we'll get into that right now. Okay, so let's bring on our guests today. We have two guests, uh, Chris McDonough and Mark Ram from the Pylons Project. Can you hear us, guys? Yes, down. I can. Excellent. And uh, where are we talking to you from? I better do this in better do this in turn, hadn't I? Because there's two of you. So, Chris, where are you? Where are you speaking to us from today? Fredericksburg, Virginia, U.S. Oh, excellent. And, and Mark, Ann Arbor, Michigan, U.S. Also. Ah, excellent, excellent. And uh, Aaron's in the uh, the Twit Cottage. I am all uh, nicely, yeah, nicely uh, getting ready for the, that big Google announcement, which we're not going to preempt. That's right. Uh, so we're here to talk about the Pylons project, and and I suppose in in order to start this off, I've been doing a bit of reading about um, about the Pylons project and the background and stuff, and I imagine there's going to be a bit of confusion for people um, because there's a there's a change going on in the project at the moment. So can you tell us a little bit about the project and uh, and what's happening right now? Sure. Um, right now, uh, the Pylons project is about, I guess, uh, almost six years old now. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a newcomer. Um, I've been doing Pylon stuff for about, I don't know, six, six or eight months now, not very long. Um, but uh, effectively, we have tried to merge two projects together. One is called uh, repose.bfg. Uh, and uh and the pylons project and um we're trying to we had very similar offerings for people in the web framework space so we're trying to what we're trying to do is actually merge the two projects together and we have a new framework as a result called pyramid 
the old framework was called pylons. So it's it's a little it's a little confusing <laughs> at this point. <laughs> So is is pyramids a different thing to pylons then? Just just to kind of clear it up for people, it's not a new name for the old pylons framework. They're different frameworks. Right, right. So pyramid is what used to be known as repose.bfg, mm -hmm. and um, repose.bfg was a framework much like pylons, uh, almost the exact same target market. You know, the exact, almost the exact same features. Um, and uh, so the old pylons web framework, which is still known as pylons. Uh, <laughs> it's the best we could do <clears throat> uh, is uh, the the piece of software that's been around for since 2005 or so. Uh, that still exists. That's still going to be maintained. But the new piece of software that we're we're excited about is called Pyramid. Um, that has been around as Repose.bfg for about two and a half years or so, um, and we're we're trying to to use the pylons project as a, as a sort of superset for both of these frameworks right now. And, and the, the whole Python web framework space seems to be um, quite congested, I suppose, at the moment. So is this an attempt to kind of pool your efforts and, um, and, and you know, consolidate resources rather than, you know, duplicate in the same kind of effort? I think so, yeah. Uh, Mark, what do you think? Oh. Oh, we can't hear him. <laughs> he's, gone, he's gone quiet. Have you got a mute button or something there that might be pressed down? No, no mute button pressed. Yeah. Okay, that's that's interesting. I'm I'm afraid you might have to answer that one. Uh, that okay, one no, for no us. worries. While we get Mark back on the line. Uh, uh, I've already forgotten the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, is the the effort to kind of make an umbrella organization is that an attempt to kind of bring together different projects and also stop a duplication of effort? Because I know that uh, the Python web framework space is, is very popular. It seems to be a very popular language for web frameworks. There's lots of frameworks out there, um, and this seems like an attempt to kind of consolidate. And is that is that one of the reasons behind it to pool resources, if you like? It is. Yeah, um, we. Uh, I first started working with Ben, who is who's uh, uh, the leader of the Pylons project. I mean, we're sort of there's there's sort of a number of leaders of the Pylons project, but uh, Ben has been with the project for the longest amount of time. About uh, as I said, about six eight months ago, and um, we started out in sort of friendly competition. Uh, I was I was trying to make the repose.bfg, which was a separate framework at the time, very fast. And uh, I posted a, a, a web blog entry about, you know, comparing it to pylons and Django and some other things. And so sort of in friendly competition, Ben tried to make his thing faster. And uh, we got in, involved in a, in a conversation that uh, sort of led to me helping him make pylons faster. And at that point, we, we, we sort of kind of knew that we had the same feelings about the web about web frameworks and uh, you know just sort of communicating between each other, which we hadn't really done before. Um, so when we uh, when we finally sort of hit it off, we knew that it was a little silly to keep competing. And there's a bunch of there's a bunch of web frameworks in the Pylons world, or excuse me, the Python world. And I just don't think we can we can't really support more than you know two or three major ones. So we're hoping to just consolidate. Mm. And, and I was actually going to, I know Mark is the uh, project lead for Turbo Gears, which is another popular Python uh, framework, which I think is, is coming in to become involved in this. So hopefully once we get his audio back, I'll quiz him a bit about that. But uh, let's, let's talk about Pyramid for now, which is the, um, the big new uh, exciting uh, framework, as you said, the, the tool that's coming out of the project. I was reading up that uh, there's only 5,000 lines of code that can potentially be triggered at runtime, and uh, you call it a small framework. So, so what does that mean to you? Well, there are um, there are five thousand lines of code that can be that can be executed in Pyramid. We have a bunch of dependencies. There are something on the order like 16, 16 or so uh, dependencies, including WebOb, which is a which is a framework to for requests and responses. And we have we have dependencies on a, a number of of Zope things, which are used basically as internal speedups. We have dependencies on templating languages and stuff. So so actually the 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 footprint of the entire framework is is not 5,000 lines. It's, it's a lot more. But inside of Pyramid itself, which sort of glues all this stuff together, there are 5,000 lines. Um, we are sort of big on testing. So there, 
although there are 5,000 5, lines of runtime code, there are 15,000 lines of test code of that stuff. Mm. Mm. Um, so, so what kind of um, applications do you think would be really suited to the Pyramid uh, framework? Uh, mostly, I think, um, uh, I, I sort of classify these things as, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of big, big systems that are, um, that are used over and over again, like CMS systems, things like that. You can build those things in Pyramid. That's sort of our, our bread and butter, my, my company at Genelist Consulting. Um, then there are bespoke systems, which are sort of just, you know, 2,000 line programs or 5,000 line programs or whatever. Uh, this is actually good at both. And I think more people right now are using it for the latter. They're, they're, they're building, you know, small web applications and mid-sized web applications and stuff. But uh, We've we I'm actually from the world of Zope, where everything's sort of enterprisey, <laughs> a bit, and <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, we've built that we've built the system with that in mind. Uh, so you can build. We actually have built on Pyramid's predecessor an application, you know, that's like 120,000 lines of code. So it's not it's not necessarily mm -hmm. just for small systems. It's for both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and uh, what kind of things are running on it at the moment? Is there any Big projects that are launching. I know Pyramid's just come to, to 1.0, uh, just been released as 1.0. Uh, so who's using it at the moment then? Uh, well, there is, there aren't very many deployments right now. Um, there are uh, there is a Chinese clothing manufacturer <laughs> using it. Uh, okay. Uh, the uh, there's a a number of environmental websites that use it. Uh, there's carlproject.org, which is which is uh, an open source sort of CMS system that we've built. Um, Pylons itself, the older Pylons framework, has many many users. Uh, and Reddit runs mm -hmm. that, and Dig runs it, and a bunch of other mm -hmm. things. But Pyramid's pretty new at this point, so it has fewer. Excellent. Well, I'm, I'm sure it'll build up over time. Um, let, let's see if if, uh, if Mark can hear us now, or if we can hear you. Uh, can, can, can you, you hear, hear us, me? Mark? Ah, we can. That's excellent. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, so I was just mentioning before, you probably heard me saying that um, I, I was reading up about you. I know you're the Turbo Gears project leader. Um, now, I, I believe Turbo Gears is, is coming in under the same umbrella uh, eventually as uh, the whole uh, pyramid under the Pylons project, if you like. So can you, can you tell us a little bit about, firstly, about Turbo Gears, I suppose, and then why you think it's, um, it's a good idea to, to get involved in what's going on here? So Turbo Gears is about... Um, five and a half years old, um, and it's a web framework for Python. Um, and we sort of took the Python philosophy of batteries included and brought it into the web framework space and said, we want to make sure that you have one framework that has everything that you need, one framework that has all of the pieces sort of pre-configured, put together, ready to go. Um, mm -hmm. And we called that the full stack approach. And that approach is slightly different than the approach that Pylons and Repose BFG had in that they were very focused on um, providing a small uh, portable set of tools that get you going, but also give you the freedom to choose a different template language, a different uh, way of storing data, et cetera, et cetera. And so Turbo Gear's approach was to pick sane defaults for all of those things and get you uh, going to a full stack a lot faster. Um, and about three years ago, we started working very closely with Pylons 1.0, uh, the existing Pylons project, and we built Turbo Gears on top of that. So it was just a set of extra tools that you got on top of Pylons. Mm -hmm. um, and so now it's very natural that we're, we're actually moving the Turbo Gears project inside of Pylons, the Pylons project, and sort of working even more closely with the same people, with Ben and the rest of the Pylons people. Um, mm. But we'll be working over time on creating a more full stack approach to uh, web frameworks than the Repose BFG slash Pyramid uh, that we have now. Mm. So, so you'll be doing slightly different things under the same kind of umbrella, if you like. Right. So we're we're going to take... And we're going to use Pyramid as the core and create um, something that helps you um, 
with a few more web development tasks uh, and sets up defaults like this templating engine will be the default. This way of uh, storing your data will be the default so that you can just get going and have a lot of pre-built components already. Excellent. Um, now, I know that you work at... Uh, I was doing some reading up, and back in, uh, I think it was 2009 now, I was at uh, EuroPython conference, which was in the UK at that time, uh, in Birmingham. Some people were telling me about the fact that SourceForge uh, were running their site on Turbo Gears now, because obviously we were all Python geeks and we were talking about Python web development. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Do, does it run on, on uh, Turbo Gears? So all of the high traffic pages, the download pages, the project summary pages, and the front page, all of that was converted over to Turbo Gears about two years ago. And then um, we released this summer um, a new tracker, wiki, uh, forums, all of that that run on Turbo Gears. That, we haven't migrated all of the projects into that new system, but all of those things run Python and run Turbo Gears now. Um, and there's still a bunch of legacy PHP code in SourceForge. We couldn't get rid of that all yet, but... Slowly over time, where <laughs> Python is is assimilating. Oh, excellent, excellent. Um, now, I, I have to confess that um, I haven't used TurboGaze that much, uh, or Pylons, but I have used Django quite a lot. Um, so I, I suppose I have to ask you guys the obligatory question, but how would you compare what you're doing to, <laughs> to say, the Django project? And would you be interested in, in maybe working together with them again in future? Because maybe we could you know, consolidate even more in some ways. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you know, you got to hand it to the Django guys. Uh, you know, I've been doing Python web stuff for, you know, almost 11 years now. And uh, before Django came along, the bar was set much lower. <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm actually a Django fan. I think they do a fantastic job in documentation and sort of community building and all sorts of things. Um, so we have, uh, we have uh, a, a, a way to... A, a way to look forward that that they've sort of paved the paved our way um and we we would certainly love to work with those guys the the major difference is that uh they mark was talking before about you know sort of full stack framework they they make certain assumptions about how you want to build an application that <clears throat> that lots of people have actually tried to tried to work around in, in their stack and, and done a done a fairly successful job at um, they assume you want to use a relational database they assume that you're going to want to use the admin interface to to bang in data and and some other things which is which is true of, of, of you know a great majority of projects but it's not universally true so this pyramid and pylons before it take a more sort of ad hoc approach and let you build things from smaller components and they make it makes fewer choices for you which is both a benefit and a and a detriment because it's probably you know it's almost certainly harder to get started, but it's also uh, you know more flexible uh, in a lot of cases. But you know I'd I'd love to work with the Django guys. I'm hoping to get the opportunity when we go to PyCon this year. So uh, I, I can understand why um, you know we've talked a lot so far just about consolidation, right? Um, and I can totally understand why. I mean, if you go to Wikipedia and look at web frameworks, there's like like 200 listed, and I, and I know that there's some on here that, that I know of that aren't even on this page, right? I mean, there's 12, there's 12 listed here just for Python, and, and, and I know that I know that this is the pyramid isn't even on here. So, yeah. uh, I mean, it's very new, so that's, you know, that, that, that's okay, but I'm just saying, you know, there's so many, I can understand why you guys need to consolidate. I guess one of the questions I have about all this consolidation work is, what I know that the different projects have different licenses, right? You guys use different licenses for the various projects that you're trying to to work with and combine. Is that a big problem? Have you had much of a, a an issue incorporating the various bits of code from that have uh, you know different licenses? What what is Turbo Gear's license, Mark? Is uh, it DS MIT? MIT. Uh, actually, the, the the three things that we're trying to sort of uh, get on the same page: uh, BFG. Pylons and Turbo Gears all have fairly similar similar licensing. They're all either BSD or MIT licensed. So currently, the the sort of default license for us is a very BS, BSD-ish license, um, and I think that's probably going to be true for for quite some time. I don't. I, I 
I can't imagine we'll we'll, we'll switch licenses. And I, it doesn't seem like many people have have much uh, much concern over whether it's MIT or BSD. But we'll listen to people if they ask. Right, right. So that's good. At least the ones that you're working with are are similar enough that the, there's not going to be a whole lot of uh, competing license issues. Right. Um, what does it take to run uh, this type of server compared to maybe maybe other frameworks? I don't know um, a lot about um, the other frameworks in terms of what what they would use, maybe Ruby on Rails or something like that. I mean, I mean, w what kind of hardware are we talking about, or does it really depend on the load that that you're going to generate with your application? Uh, it's it, it can run on very small systems. As a matter of fact, uh, Chris Davies, who's uh, who's uh, a contributor to um, to pyramid has gotten it gotten it running on his android <laughs> so uh <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> but uh it's it's not a very it's not a very big system it's not a very complicated system um it's very fast we've we've tried to make sure that uh it runs as fast as possible for the simplest things um we we put a, a whole bunch of work into that uh and it's it's fairly small it doesn't have much much you know in the way of memory requirements or anything so um it's not a very complicated system. It's 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 pretty small, uh, so it kind of depends basically on what kind of site you wanna you wanna build. I think. Right, right. So, and that's the answer to a lot of things, right? I mean, it depends on depends on what the what the work workload is. I mean, that's what we always talk about in the storage uh, 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 ecosystem that I'm that I'm a part of. Well, what's your workload? You know, that'll 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 tell me what you need. You got to tell me your workload first. You mentioned that um, Dig was using pylons. I'm just kind of curious. Do you know much about their implementation and why they chose pylons? Because I think that would be a great example for people listening that may not be familiar with um, web frameworks or why why you would choose between different web frameworks. Well, to be honest with you, uh, the only reason I say Dig uses it is because there's a Dig logo on the pylons front page. <laughs> so I don't, wow. I don't know much more about it, but I know that Reddit actually runs pylons uh, exclusively for their for their serving their pages. I don't, I'm not sure about what Dig uses it for, to be honest. Okay. You, right. Do you know, Mark? I don't know the details. I do know that Reddit switched to pylons from uh, another Python web framework, uh, just sort of for standardization and flexibility. Okay. Mm. Re Reddit also became open source not that long ago as well. Uh, I remember there was a big fuss about that. Everyone was really excited that there was an open source alternative to, to Dig, essentially. Yeah, yeah, they sorry, they just thought I'd, sorry, go on. Uh, I I I was going to say I think they have their their code out on GitHub so you can take a look at how they do their ranking if you want to <laughs> try to scam. <laughs> uh, that must be I mean I think that's a great example of uh you know cuz that is a pretty risky thing to do, right? If you're a if you're a ranking type site like Dig or Reddit to open source your code and and potentially expose yourself to uh nefarious uh, uh people that might want to uh uh, you know, add votes to the, whatever their story is to gain, uh, um, you know, Google juice or whatever. So, uh, so I think that speaks for, for the open source and the security of open source that by open sourcing their software, they could, um, uh, actually make, make the software more secure and still run in a very secure manner. So I, that's a side topic, but it's the, one of the things I talk a lot about with open source. Um, so, so if I wanted to implement, um, pylons or pyramid, what, what else would I need to be running? on uh, on my server well um, mostly you need to, de to decide what's what sort of persistent system you want most people use a relational database and when people use a relational database they tend to use an uh, object relational mapper uh, orm like SQL alchemy usually um, so they're they're sort of a a you know pre-cut path we have we have these things called paster templates which are essentially just uh, we render out you know, a starter application to the file system using a template, and there are a number of those. There's one. There's there's one that smells a lot like the older Pylons framework, which people render it out. It's called Pyramid under SQL A, and that sets up SQL Alchemy. Um, it sets up a a sort of Pylons esque way of uh, of of organizing files on the file system inside the application. There's another one for uh, ZODB, which is a Zope object database. Another paster template for that. Um, other folks have worked on other ones. We, th that's our actual sort of main um, opinion extension mechanism. I mean, lots of these are, are, are opinions. 
and people want their web framework to do a certain thing and do it a certain way, we let them do that by creating these pacer templates and they can sort of meld pyramid to how they want to do it. Um, then, you, then you have to make a choice of your templating system. Uh, pyramid comes with, with two. Uh, one's called Chameleon, and that's an XML-based templating system, and the other one's called uh, Mako, which is non-XML-based. Um, and then we have bindings to other ones like Jinja and stuff. So basically, you just have to sort of make decisions about what you want. Um, and if you don't want to make decisions, then you have to pick somebody else's decisions in the form of a paster template. Right, right. Well, at least you have the templates, which, uh, uh, you know, helps people get then, started. I mean, that, that may not have done it before. Right. And then what else do you need in the background? Uh, I mean, obviously, you've got Apache running, right? Um you're, you know, you're running this on top of Linux, most likely, um, and you've got Apache running. What else? Anything else? PHP also running in the background or no? So in order to run it, what you really need is a Python install. Mm -hmm. And then it ships with a, a web server. So you can uh, start it up from a command line just from there. And you don't have to have Apache or Nginx or anything else running in front of it. And it'll run on Windows, Linux, OS 10, uh, anywhere where you can run Python. Um, obviously, in high traffic deployments, it makes sense to put Apache or something else in front as a proxy uh, to handle slow connections and that sort of thing. Um, but it really comes standalone, ready to run. Uh, so if you have a small, like, intranet sort of application, you can just code it up, type the command, and it's running and ready to go. Wow. So 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 it sounds like it's fairly easy to deploy then. Yeah, I mean you do have to be able to have a long running process. So a lot of uh, very low cost uh, Linux uh, shared hosting platforms don't really let you do that, and so um, it can be um, more difficult to deploy there than say PHP. Mm -hmm. um, but if you own a server, it is extraordinarily easy to deploy this. Okay. And what, what about hosting services? Are there people that, um, you know, maybe since since Pyramid is new, maybe maybe Pylons is a better example here, but are, are there hosting services that allow you to deploy uh, your, your, your web um, layout on top of a Pylons framework? Yeah, there, there, um, there are a number of, uh, of uh, dedicated web hosts or, or I guess, not exactly sure what to call them, but like uh, Web Faction is one of them, and those guys actually offer sort of right out of the box. You can you can pick pylons and get it installed and and everything. I, I I'm hoping they have they have Pyramid soon, um, but uh, both pylons and Pyramid also run on Google App Engine, so you can deploy to Google App Engine if you like, and then you don't have to own any machines or do anything. I mean, it's very easy deployment. Um, and there are a number of a number of other companies who actually offer pylons pylons hosting, uh, and hopefully soon pyramid hosting. Um, but uh, it's it's definitely not a, not as easy to get deployed as PHP. That's sort of the gold standard of how how you sh how you should be able to deploy things. Mm -hmm. And uh, but as a as a community, sort of a, in the more generic web community of of Python, we're we're sort of working on that, trying to make it a little bit easier through standards like WSG. Mm. So what kind of um, databases and things do you supply? I'm assuming all the, the main uh, standard ones that people would know, MySQL, Postgres maybe. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, uh, most people tend to use uh, this, this object relational map, mapper called SQL Alchemy. And SQL Alchemy actually supports, I think, uh, it, it supports MySQL, it supports Postgres, uh, mm -hmm. It supports Oracle, and I'm Mark. Is that is that it? Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, SQL Lite. I mean, pretty much all of the standard databases. Um, I think it supports some Firebird and some other ones that I've never used. <laughs> <laughs> and excellent. Uh, excellent. Yeah, but we also we also do a lot of non-relational stuff. Um, uh, I'm I'm currently building a project with Mongo right now. I've used um, the Zop the Zop object database before with with Pyramid that works works very well. So uh, it's it's very unopinionated. It will as long as you give it a hand it a connection, you can you can sort of do what you like. So 
Mm. Yeah, it's interesting because I'm, I'm kind of looking at this coming from someone who's used uh, Django quite a lot and it really kind of sticks out to me what you said about Django makes decisions for you in some ways, which is good in some, at some times and bad at others because I'm kind of looking at it as uh, whenever I develop an application in something like Django, I've got the object relational mapper and it kind of automatically puts you into that create a class that will be a table, all that kind of stuff. So it's interesting to, to see how flexible this is. Um, so one thing I was curious about is uh, the old Pylons uh, web framework is it's still around, but I believe it's not going to be um, actively developed. I mean, enhanced anymore. It's going to be maintained and kept going. Um, so what's what's the future for that? Is it is it going to be just uh, kept around and maintained until people migrate or something like that? Well, well, first of all, thank you for doing your homework. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, but. Uh, there, there probably will be at least one more release of the the, the older Pylons framework, uh, a 1.1 release, which will hopefully get Pylons users closer to being able to migrate to Pyramid. But, but even if they don't migrate to Pyramid, it'll still have improvements in it. And, um, but I think after that, uh, unless someone else chooses to come along and sort of maintain it and uh, not maintain it, we'll, we'll always maintain it, but improve it and and add features to mm -hmm. it. I'm, I'm sure that if Someone came along who had a had a huge investment in it that that uh, we wouldn't tell them to pound sand. They're gonna they're gonna be able to to maintain it and and improve it as they like. But um, for for the most part, we're we're committed to pyramid at this point. Mm. And is there um, any uh, roadmap or anything for people to migrate from say pylons to pyramid if they've already got a pylons project? Um, is there any plans to to get some kind of easy migration uh, in there? Uh, there is a, uh, a a gentleman by the name of Mike Orr is is creating a guide to port pylons applications to Pyramid. Um, hmm. That is that isn't finished yet. He's also the author of this of this paster template, which lets lets people have a sort of pylon esque familiar familiar sort of thing. Um, hmm. I'm hoping to see that within the next uh, three or four days. I think. Um, and it won't be perfect, you know. It's it's not the same framework. They're they're gonna they're gonna need to change things, and we're we're hoping mm -hmm. that people uh, people like see enough improvements in it that they'll that they'll they'll switch over. But if they don't, that's okay too, because the old framework is is plenty good and it's fine, and we'll maintain it and whatever whatever mm -hmm. whatever people need. Mm, excellent. Um, now I, I was just uh, wondering about on a more I suppose philosophical level um, about the whole situation with Python web frameworks. Um, you have to forgive me, I don't get to speak to, to you know, Python web framework project leads that much. And I'm wondering, um, <clears throat> do you think there's something about the language that makes it so popular for web frameworks? Because there's a hell of a lot of, I mean, I know there's, uh, good job Randall's not here because he'd be screaming at me that Python's got much better <laughs> frameworks. But um, I know there's lots of frameworks for every language, but um, being, being, you know, involved in Python and stuff, it seems to me that there's a lot of different web frameworks. Is there something about the language that, that you think um, lends itself to this sort of thing. Uh, Chris, you got any thoughts? I, it's just really easy to make one. Uh, it, mm. Python comes with with a bunch of web tools already installed, and it comes with you know as of as of 2004 to 2005 or so a standard for hooking up uh, mm. uh, applications to servers called WSG. So it's it's trivial to make a web framework. You can do it in in a day. Um, it's not trivial to write the documentation. <laughs> And I think mm. uh, I think most most things need need some documentation love. Mm. Yeah, and and support as well. Obviously, I mean you have to keep keep the support up and stuff. Um, so, uh, Mark, you got any thoughts on that on that kind of point? Well, I do think that it's really easy. I mean, I have probably written five or six web frameworks that I've thrown away <laughs> um, in the past. I know many, many other, it's sort of a rite of passage if you're a Python web developer that you write your own web framework. You're like, oh, I can do better. Um, everybody thinks that they can. And on some one angle, everyone does better um, than something that already exists. So they think they can do better on everything. And then it gets to be a lot of work and then they get abandoned. Um, and I don't think anything is Python specific about that, except that in the first four or five hours, you can be very productive in making a web framework. And so it's really easy to get a landscape that's littered with the beginnings of web frameworks or web frameworks that do 80% of the job. Um, but I think that's true of PHP. I mean, there's a million uh, frameworks in PHP in the post 
uh, Rails world. I think in mm. Ruby it happened that there was one that was huge really fast, uh, and so there wasn't as much fragmentation. But I, I don't think that there's anything different about Python or Ruby um, in the language or the support for the libraries. It's really just historical artifact. Mm. See, and I Dan, presume you're using. Sorry, go on. Oh, I was just going to say I, I did a bunch of uh, I did a bunch of homework on Catalyst because I thought Randall might be around. Uh, and I needed to know yeah, something about yeah. it, but apparently I don't need to know anything about it, so it's it's fine. Well, some, <laughs> somewhere in the distance on a cruise ship, there's a screen going up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously, I should say other languages are available. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, just sticking to, to Python for the moment. Um, are you both using 2.6? Then you're using Python 2.6. Um, any thoughts on Python 3? Uh, you looking forward to that? Uh, I typically use Python 2.6 right now, um, slowly sort of, of making Python 2.7 my default. Um, Python 3 mm. is uh, in the future. We, are, uh, we need to convert a bunch of dependencies, um, primarily WebOB, which is, which is Ian Bicking's re request response framework. Um, and some rumblings about doing that conversion have been floated to do at PyCon this year, which is in, which is in uh, March, I guess. And um, hmm. so we have, we have a bunch of work to do to get it to Python 3. Luckily, uh, recently, the Python web community has settled on a, on a PEP, PEP 3333 Python enhancement proposal thing, which, uh, which lets us move forward. Before, it was, uh, it was a bit of a mess because Python 3, do the way that it treats Unicode and strings differently, didn't have the same sort of standard about hooking up applications to servers. Um, mm -hmm. But within the last two weeks or so, they've we've 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 all gotten tired enough about of arguing about it that we just gave in and <laughs> it's good enough. And uh, so it's it's good. And hopefully hopefully we'll uh, we'll we'll be able to port. It's 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 a non trivial trivial effort. It's it's also a non trivial effort to straddle two versions. So we have a bunch of thinking to do about it. Mm, excellent. So, um, Mark, you got any thoughts on Python 3? Or Python 3000, I believe I'm supposed to call it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think um, Python 3 is obviously a target. It's been difficult because of the lack of a, a WSGI uh, WSGI standard. Uh, and so we're, we're sort of past that and now can start really moving. Um, but I think also Python 2.6 and 2.7 are really good. Um, and we've had a lot of success with them. And so the, the motivation to move as fast as we could uh, hasn't been um, there all the time. But I, I certainly think over the next year, you're going to see a lot of uh, movement in various libraries um, becoming Python 3 compatible. And Python 3 is going to start um, picking up the pace more in the next year than it has um, partly because of standards being available, but partly just it's been around long enough and the the path forward for supporting both has become clearer and clearer. Mm. So so beyond just moving to Python three then, what is the uh, what are the next developments for pylons? I mean, what kind of features are you guys looking to add? Well, there, we're, we're probably going to do a lot of library work. Um, there, there are a bunch of bindings we still need to provide, like form, la form library bindings and other templating system bindings and, and other stuff. But in the, in, the, in the medium to long term, what we want to do is we want to build applications and, and other frameworks on top, of, on top of the system that let people do things more easily in a, in a, in a sort of more... Uh, you know, Django-ish, I guess, way. Not, not, not really trying to compete with Django, but, but more uh, about being able to develop applications very, very quickly. You know, getting something up and running in a matter of minutes instead of a matter of hours. You know. So more, um, more, more templates, more plugins, more libraries, right. uh, Readily available. Right. Right. And um, you know, ter the our our, our uh, sort of story is. Uh, that we'd like the Turbogears folks to uh, to help us build that stuff. Um, when I say Turbogears folks, I mean the folks that are that have traditionally contributed to Turbogears one and two. Um, that'll probably that's an ongoing effort. Um, they're you know we're 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 hopefully going to going to be able to 
cooperate with those with existing Turbgears people. We also have a bunch of Zope people that are interested in building building that sort of stuff. So that should be uh, an interesting meld of <laughs> communities. <laughs> So, I mean, mm. we talked about how, uh, you know, Pylons is may, might have one more release in it. What about Turbo Gears? I mean, what's the future of, of Turbo Gears? Is it also going to continue to be developed or is it, uh, is it kind of get, gonna, going to be in maintain mode as well? Um, well, we expect um, that Turbo Gears 2 will continue to be developed. There's a 2.1 uh, point fix release that will be coming out relatively soon. Um, but they'll probably be 2.2 two and 2.3, um, and development on that will continue um, on top of the existing Pylons 1.0 and 1.1 uh, development. But we really see the future, the long-term, the medium to long-term future as uh, working together and cooperating with other folks from Pylons and Repose and Zoop to create a new uh set of tools and work together on those. Okay. Uh, so that's sort of where we're headed. We're not in quite in maintenance mode, but it's not the future of Turbo Gears anymore. Right, right. So Turbo Gears will continue to be around, but then at some point, Pyramid will be it? I mean, Pyramid will be the way to go? and, and, and or, or, will there, or will there always be a Turbo Gears as an alternative? Well, right now... Turbo Gears is something on top of Pylons 1.0. Um, we may not use the Turbo Gears name, but there will be something on top of Pyramid. Right. Uh, it may use the Turbo Gears name. It's just whether we want to confuse people or not. <laughs> not, um, not that it's confusing. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not confusing at all. There's no confusion. Consolidation always happens smoothly and nobody ever gets confused. Right. <laughs> Especially in but, this space. There's just so many different uh, different things you can choose from. I mean, that's why I was saying before, any kind of consolidation that we can get, I think, is, uh, is beneficial. Mm. Yeah, yeah, maybe so one thing... Oh, sorry, guys. One one thing uh, I, I was curious about is how um, how do you interact with the rest of the Python community? Then do you have a lot of community input to this? Uh, is there a lot of uh, other people who can commit to the project and so on? Yeah, currently there, <clears throat> according to Olo, anyway, there are uh, uh, ninety people who have who have committed things into the Pylons repository, um, and uh, typically, you know. I, I hang out on IRC all the time. I'm, I'm an IRC addict. And so I'm on the Pylons channel, on the Repose channel, on the Poku channel, which is the, the Flask framework guys channel inside of the, all, you know, Django, all those all those places. And I uh, try to communicate as best as I can with, with all those folks. And then, you know, sort of officially inside of uh, the, you know, the, the larger Python world, there is a, a web SIG special interest group mailing list that uh, is where people talk about standards and, and stuff, and I try to participate in that as well. Um, so we're hoping that, uh, you know, at least, at very least, that we we reduce the number of frameworks in the Python web space by one, whether that means, you know, mm -hmm. uh, just naming or whatever, just so people don't get confused. Uh, not that we're helping at the moment, but, um, but over the long haul, uh, we're hoping that, that we can build small tools that, that lots of people can use and people start talking about, you know, I built my, I built, I built my web application in Python. You know, we, we, we're, we're mm. not, you know, we, we, we want to contribute to the Python community, um, more than we want to make our own, little fiefdom, so. Mm. Mm. Hey, that I makes think, sense. Uh, sorry, Mark, yeah, you got some thoughts on this? Well, I was going to say, I think there's a lot of, surprisingly, like there are a lot of Python web frameworks, but there's a lot of friendship and a lot of working together between those frameworks. I uh, obviously have known Chris and Ben for a long time, but Armin Ronacker, um, many, Jacob, from Django, all of us sort of are friends and hang out and would like to hang out together more. Um, and we we all want to work together. And so we're all looking a lot of times looking for ways that we can work together better and work together more. And it's 
it's sort of from the outside it it might look like it's competitive but really on the inside it's very friendly and cooperative um and hmm. it's just really a matter of finding the ways to work together more hmm. uh, you mentioned all hanging out more um i know there's a lot of uh, community events in the in the Python world, the people people who don't like Python are going to hate me after this show because I, I just go on about it all the time. But there we go. Um, I know that, that you guys are actually um, you you two gentlemen are going to be doing a talk with uh, Ben Baggett, I believe it is at uh, PyCon in Atlanta. So can you tell us a little bit about that as a teaser? <laughs> yeah, I, um, essentially this this talk was was uh, promoted or uh, submitted before before we had this thing called Pyramid. So it's called the State of of uh, pylon slash turbogear slash repose.bfg. We didn't have a name for, well, we kind of still don't have a name for all the combination of things. <laughs> but um, but basically, we're just going to sort of talk about how, we, how we're how we able to, to work together and how we're able to produce uh, something that we hope, we hope people like. Um, so it's a 45-minute talk. Please come to PyCon. It's a lot of fun. We'll drink some beer. Mm, excellent. <laughs> Yeah, sounds good. Um, so, I mean, I um, I suppose we should kind of wrap, start wrapping things up by, um, by by telling people how they can find out more if they're interested, if they want to find out about Pyramid and Turbo Gears and what's going on. Um, where's the best place to go to to find out more about all of this? Uh, for Pyramid and um, the Pylons Project, uh, PylonsProject.org is the right place to go. Um, all of our code is on GitHub at. Uh, mm. GitHub, GitHub slash pylons, um, and basically I'm on IRC. There, there are IRC. Most most of our development happens through IRC. Uh, so there's a pound pylons channel and a pound pyramid channel on freenode.net on the IRC, uh, freenode freenode IRC network that that mm -hmm. folks should be encouraged to join. It's a lot of fun. And you've actually just launched the new site today, haven't you? Pylon pro, uh, pylons project. I think that site's <laughs> yeah. just launched today. Is that it, right? It, it, it it launched last night, and actually, I gotta yeah. gotta give a sh gotta give a shout out to Blaze Laflam who worked uh, tirelessly to get that thing up, so that we had a URL yeah. to give out. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. So, um, I suppose, I suppose to wrap things up, I'm gonna have to ask you Randall's favorite question. I'm not gonna ask you the Perl versus Python question because I think we probably know the answer. Although you might want to answer that. He, he always asks people whether they prefer Perl or Python. So I suppose I'll ask you, Chris, what do you think? <laughs> So he's not here, well, so we can say what we want. <laughs> I can't. I can't do it on his back. Uh, okay. But I, 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 I am actually an old Perl programmer. Uh, I, I used Randall's Randall's books uh, for for years. I, I wrote a lot of mod Perl applications, and I uh, still still mm -hmm. call the uh, decorate sort undecorate pattern um, the short CN transform. So he yeah, should be. Yeah. He was very uh, uh, influential in my development career. Excellent. Um, so I, I will ask you his, his favorite question, which is uh, Vi or Emacs. So Mark, Vi or Emacs, which is your favorite? Vi. Vi? Oh, oh okay. Yay. God. That's okay. See, Randall's an Emacs guy, so I know he won't be happy. <laughs> Chris, Vi, Vi or Emacs? Emacs. God. I can't quite <laughs> I can see I can see problems developing in the project. Here. We found, the difference. <laughs> found something for you guys to have a flame war about. <laughs> Excellent. Um, oh yeah, they always so get thank, along, right? So, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, uh, anything else you want to say before we uh, before we let you go? Anything else you want to mention or, or anything? Uh, no. I think we're good. Nope. I, I I hope people. Um, Get excited about the project and join the RC channel and start contributing. Excellent. So, um, Mark, any any last thoughts? Anything you want to add? Well, I'm I'm really personally very excited about the amount of uh, forward motion on working together. Everybody has been saying uh, for four years. We had a lot of talk at PyCon four years ago about how we wanted to work together, um, and then. Three years ago, Turbo Gears and Pylon started working together more closely. And it seems like every year there seems to be more and more. Um, so I'm really excited about the general progression in the Python world of people working together and finding ways to do things together. Um, it's crazy and messy, but I'm glad we're doing it. 
I, did, I, I did want a, to... a good note to good note to end on. So thank you, thank you both for joining us, and uh, we obviously wish you the best with uh, yes. future endeavours. Thank you. Cool. Very good. All right. So that was uh, that was uh, pylons, pyramid, and everything else. <laughs> There's a lot yeah. of a lot of names we were throwing out there. So. Mm. Hopefully it wasn't too yeah, confusing. Look, yeah, that's one of the things I wanted to try and cover up is is um, uh, you know try and cover that fact that it is, it can be confusing, especially now because they're they're changing uh, you know they're changing things so much and, and merging projects and all that kind of stuff. I was a bit in, I was intrigued about the the fact that they're calling it the Pylons project because I think a lot of people will just associate that with the old Pylons framework and it's going to take some time before this kind of settles down. Right. Well, it could be good or bad. I mean, it could be a good transition uh, strategy as well. If, if people know pylons, right, and, mm. uh, you know, they're used to that, then yeah, maybe that's okay because at least then when you're doing a Google search or whatever, you'll come, ac you'll come across the right website and then it'll be like, you know, there'll be a lot of information there about Pyramid instead. Um, mm. But I, I think that might be if there are a lot of developers and a lot of people that are, are used to pylons, maybe that's a good strategy to start there. And then over, you know, as, as more and more people start adopting uh, pyramid because it is quite new right now uh, as more and more mm. people start adopting it then maybe there's a pyramid project.org or something that's true and I, I suppose there's definitely the branding issue which you which you rightly mentioned there if people already know pylons then it seems stupid to throw that you know throw that brand away and and, uh, and not make use of it so um, yeah very interesting to hear about that I'll, I'll be interested to uh, see what happens in the future I hope I didn't uh, get into too much Python fanboyism there and, and make everyone <laughs> turn off all the Perl fans and Ruby fans. We love all languages on this show. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, I should say that just before Randall comes and hits me over the head or something. Um, so um, coming up in the next uh, two to three weeks, uh, Randall's actually away for uh, three weeks, I believe. So you're stuck with me for, um, for three shows, uh, for another two shows after this, I should say. Uh, next week on February the 9th, we've got uh, Dan Walsh from Red Hat who's coming in to join myself and Simon Phipps to talk about uh, SE Linux, which is a, uh, it's a security, I'm going to explain this badly, and I'm sure Dan will tell, will tell a much better story next week, but uh, it's, it's essentially, it's a security layer, which uh, was developed to go onto, uh, on top of the Linux kernel on Linux systems, uh, developed in association with people like the FBI and the NSA and all kinds of scary names like that. Uh, so you'd imagine it's quite secure. And um, I can't wait to hear more about that from uh, Dan Walsh, who's going to tell us more. The big pain uh, in the, the week... butt is what it is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's probably, I'll, that's I'll be, probably, I'll be yeah. tuning in next week to, to, try to, to try to figure out uh, how to effectively use it because uh, I know yeah. my, my personal experience is that it's, uh, it's just a pain. So. I think the most, I, I, I can say this this week because uh, Dan's not here, so I, I'll, I'll try not to say this next week, but I think the, the question I hear most about SE Linux uh, in forums and other places is how do I turn it off? Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. So you know, how do I stop it from, from blocking what I'm trying to do? Uh, yep. But but now we, we, we want to hear about that, see, see what he's got to say. Um, obviously, there are lots of, um, lots of great security uses for it. Uh, on February the 16th, we've got uh, Tornado Plug. Uh, is the project, and uh, we're going to be talking to the project leader about um, it, it's a it's a very cool little um, server in a in a very small form factor, which you actually plug straight into a power socket, and it's got an Ethernet port on it and a USB port, I think, and uh, you just run it off that. It runs uh, a, a Linux server that you just plug into a wall, and you can use it for a file server, uh, so storage. You could hook up, you know, a USB um, a drive, a large USB drive. Um, obviously, storage, that's your area, Aaron. Yeah, it's um, very cool, very cool. Yeah, and, and, and it uses, uh, it's quite quite low powered as well. It uses a low amount of power, I believe. And you can use it for a web server and all kinds. So that, that sounds pretty cool. Every geek should have one in Absolutely. their home, it sounds like. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we'll have on the 23rd, February 23rd, we'll, Randall will be back. Uh, he returns to uh, to speak to Jeremy Carbo about Sunlight Labs, which I have to confess I don't know a lot about at the moment. So um We'll find out more as we go, and I'm sure Randall will be able to, to fill us in. So um, if, if you uh, want to find out what's coming up on the show, there is a link on uh, twit.tv slash floss. There's a link on there to our uh, spreadsheet where we have all the upcoming guests, and you can have a look through and see who's on the slate and, uh, and find out what's coming up. And if, you, uh, if there's something that you think should be on there that's not on there, you can uh, a project that you'd like to see on the show, the best thing you can do is ask the project leader to email Randall 
and um, that's the fastest way to get to the top of the list. And uh, you need to email Merlin at Stonehenge.com. Um, that's Merlin with a Y. Um, M E R M E. I can't spell M E R L Y N. Merlin at Stonehenge.com. And uh, Randall will get your email, and we'll we'll get that uh, sorted out. And uh, yep. So what, uh, coming up uh, next week uh, at, at the weekend, in fact, I've got FOSDEM, which is a uh, a large free software conference in uh, Belgium, in Brussels. Lucky old me. And um, so I'll be there uh, with uh, Fab, my Linux Outlaws co-host, and uh, we'll be meeting up with some other people. I've just spoken to Simon Phipps. He's going to be there as well. So. Should be interesting. Lots of uh, free software geeks and, and open source geeks getting together in, in Belgium. It's going to be a lot of fun. So if you go into that, um, keep an eye out for me. Come and say hello. I'll be pleased to, to catch up with you. Um, and, and don't, then, don't uh, forget beer and waffles as well. Yeah, and chocolate. <laughs> and Chocolate's chocolate, big. right. Yeah, chocolate. I so, love Brussels. I mean, it's great. Yeah, I've not actually been yet, so it's going to be interesting. I've been to been to all over Germany and France and Holland and all kinds of places. I've never actually made it to Brussels yet, so let's hope I uh, I make it there safe. Um, yeah, so that's going to be fun. That'll be uh, that'll be a good uh, a good event, hopefully, and I'll report back on that next week. I'll be back. Uh, in the meantime, uh, if you want to find out anything more about me, you can do. You go to danlynch.org. That's the address, and there's all kinds of stuff on there: music and blogs and. Yeah, all kinds of silliness, so you can find out more there. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter or Identica, you can do. Uh, the username is Method Dan. That's the two words, Method and Dan, stuck together. The uh, Some of the hip-hop fans may get the reference there. And uh, you can uh, you can find me on there. Uh, Aaron, where can we find out more about you? Uh, so as usual, you can uh, view all of my uh, podcasts at thesourceshow.org. Um, or you can just go to AaronNewcomb.com and follow me on Twitter, Facebook, uh, uh, whatever your favorite uh, uh, social media application is. Um, you can follow me on AaronNewcomb.com and uh, find out more there. Uh, just just as a note, I will be doing some more podcasts uh, as soon as we get in a house. <laughs> right now we're still in, in an apartment. It's awfully hard to do podcasts. You're not living in the Twit Cottage, though, are you? You're not living under the desk. No, no. <laughs> it's much too small That's here. <laughs> it's, it's probably about the yeah. same size as my apartment, actually. Uh, yeah. But maybe when Leo gets the new studio built, I'll, uh, he'll give me a room over there or something. Oh, that'd be nice. Yeah. yeah. So we, we can't wait to hear more more podcasts from uh, from yeah. yourself in the future. Yeah. In fact, you know, if if people are listening and they've got a project or they've got an idea, an open source uh, project, or, um, you know, my show's also about making things. Um, hacking devices and things like that. So um, if anyone has an idea and they'd like someone to do a, a, a segment or a, a video podcast about their project, feel free to contact me either through Twitter or Facebook or, or what have you and uh, let me know. I'd be glad to jump in and, and put that on my list as a potential podcast, uh, video podcast in the future. Excellent. Sounds good. And uh, so I think it just remains to say thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, thank you to thank you, Aaron, for, for uh, stepping in and, and making the very early trip into the, the Twit Cottage. It's not too bad for me because of the time difference. It's like <laughs> five, five o'clock, five o'clock in the evening here, which is fine. I, you know, I'm usually awake at this time, but yeah. uh, I know it's a little early for you. So thank you for making the trip. in. Yep. No problem. And uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, I'll be back with Simon Phipps to talk about SE Linux, and we'll see how easy it is to switch off or not. So uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>